Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started with the next session here. Uh, so we're going to run this a little bit different than the previous session. This is going to be set up as a panel style um, session. And we're going to hear from three watershed management authority representatives. We're going to start with Jody Bailey, representing the, the English River WMA, and she works on behalf of the city of Pomona. Um, then we're going to hear from Jen Pencil, who works with the East Central Iowa Council of Government, who represents the Indian Creek WMA. And then Rob Elsizer, um, who works with the Turkey River WMA, and he um, works for Northeast Iowa RCMP. So the focus of their talk, actually, we were at the previous session, we got a great segue um, when uh, Jason was answering questions about you know, the social science aspects. This session is going to focus specifically on some of the social science and research that has been done on overall attitudes about watershed issues and each of their respective watershed management issues. And all of this information is being used to help further the planning processes that are occurring in each of the different areas. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to you. Thanks for coming out on this lovely day. I actually just want to clarify, I'm an independent planning consultant, but I was originally contracted by the city of Kelowna to spearhead the creation of the English River WMA. And I am now employed through a grant that we have as the watershed coordinator. So I'm just going to start out with a little bit of background. I'm not going to get too much into this. But for those of you not familiar with the southeast corner of Iowa, the English River watershed is part of the lower Iowa Cockade. It's about 630 square miles, and it extends from actually outside Grinnell city limits all the way down the riverside. If you've ever been to the riverside casino, joins up with the Iowa River there. It covers portions of six different counties. It includes 13 communities, and the largest community in the watershed is Kelowna, which is population, I think, 2,300. So it kind of gives you an idea of the demographic that we're talking about here. Using GIS, we've estimated the total population of the watershed to be 21,000. 83% of the residents in the watershed live in urban areas. So developing the social indicators um, through the survey was just one part of the com comprehensive watershed assessment <clears throat> that we've been working on for the 319 program grant through Iowa DNR. Our project partners with this project have been the Iowa Soybean Association and the Iowa Flood Center. And these are all the components that we're doing as part of the comprehensive watershed assessment. So the survey instrument was 33 questions long, and we'll be using the responses in a qualitative sense um, to develop the goals and objectives uh, that will be part of this plan. So we're not making any broad generalizations of trends in the watershed. We just really kind of wanted to take the temperature about attitudes and perceptions about water resource issues in the watershed. <laughs> We wanted to find out directly from landowners what BMPs are using, what barriers to practice that they've experienced, and we wanted to hear directly from them what are the impacts of, say, flood issues and water quality issues on their personal properties and their livelihoods. Our report is available on our website, so I'm not really going to get into the nitty gritty of the methodology. If you want to learn more about that, I encourage you to download the report. But in a nutshell, uh, we designed it in-house. Uh, that's myself and a graduate student intern in urban and regional planning, Vanessa Fixmer arrives. We use <coughs> county parcel data, and we pulled a random sample of 688 property owners from that data. The survey was provided in both an online and an on paper format. Of course, it was anonymous. And this map actually shows the distribution of the random sample population um, <coughs> of folks that we then invited to take the survey. So who took this survey? We got 163 surveys back, which for being an organization most folks in the watershed have yet to hear of, we've only been on the ground for a year and a half, we thought was pretty impressive. Um, I figured anything over 15% would be uh, cause for joy, so we exceeded that, and I was pretty happy with that. Interestingly enough, three quarters of those who took the survey were male. Uh, on average, they were 63 years old, 52% self-identified as being farmers. That was a question on our survey. Half of the landowners rent out some portion of their land. <coughs> 
And three quarters of those that said they did not live on their watershed properties said that they lived within 50 miles of those properties. So not the most absentee of absentee landowners. So I'm just going to kind of gloss over what we felt were some of the highlights and, shall we say, lowlights of our survey results. To begin with, we learned that the majority of landowners surveyed really aren't that concerned about the safety of their drinking water. We also asked them to grade the quality of surface water in the watershed, and the majority of folks felt that the quality of water was good. A uh, significant third of those who took the survey said fair. We also presented a variety of possible water contamination sources, this list you see right here. And we asked the survey takers whether each, whether they felt each of these was either responsible or not responsible for contemporary water quality issues in the state of Iowa. Just for fun, I want to see if anybody wants to hedge their bets and, and tell me what you think maybe one of the top three were. Any Lawn and golf courses. Good <laughs> choice. Any others? Agriculture. Agriculture. City sewers. And remember the farmers made up 52% of those surveyed, right? But that was a trick question. Because surprisingly enough, agricultural crop production was actually uh, found responsible um, by 72% of those who took the survey which we weren't expecting. Um, it was also interesting to us that illegal dumping and littering topped the list, and livestock and poultry, another ag-related uh, field, basically, was also in that top three. Not, not what we expected. So we broke down the results by those that identified themselves as farmers and not <coughs> And this got even more surprising. Farmers were actually more likely to say that ag was a culprit than the non-farmers. It makes sense to us that farmers cited illegal dumping and littering. I grew up at the end of a dead end road in a river valley, and we would discover new refrigerators and all kinds of um, household refuse on a pretty regular basis if someone just came out in the middle of the night and dumped off. And interestingly enough, too, those that are non farmers <clears throat> identified construction erosion, which makes sense. Folks who live in developed areas are probably more aware of construction going on around it. But how interesting the, the differences between the farmers and non-farmers when it came to the percentages that, that felt that agriculture was responsible and the percentages, I mean, illegal dumping and littering could be more, could be on more opposite end of the spectrum. And of course, my favorite part of survey analysis, as always, are the comments. <laughs> <laughs> We laughed, we cried, we had fun analyzing the survey results. So we also presented a variety of policy statements. These are things, we need to do more of this, we need to do less of that, we need more of this, we need less of that. Everything from regulations to education, um, habitat, um, protecting farmland, on and on and so forth. And we asked folks what degree do they either agree or disagree with those statements. And then we took it a step further in analyzing the results and broke down the responses by farmers and non-farmers. And again, we found that the two groups were, in our opinion, a little less polarized than we expected them to be. Do note that farmers seem to favor statements about incentives a little bit more than the non-farming population who seem to emphasize things like habitat and education for statements that they uh, somewhat or strongly agree with. How many total? Um, that's a good question. I think there were about 20 statements, to give you an idea. Don't quote me on it. Somewhere in the ballpark. We also asked folks what other uh, policy issues they're concerned about. Again, some of our sampling of some of the comments that we've received that I think are, might be a good representation of attitudes in the watershed. Comments about global warming, 
incompetent politicians, journalists. <coughs> so we also surveyed folks about the impact of flooding and water quality issues on their own lives and property. Um, Kelowna is at the bottom third of the watershed, and so they put the seed money into creating the WMA because those at the bottom of the watershed are disproportionately affected by flooding. Many other areas in the watershed just are not. And you can see this in the survey results that you know two thirds of those said they're really not concerned uh, about future flooding affecting their life. We also surveyed folks on whether, you know, we, we asked two separate questions. Do you feel that enough is being done to address water quality issues in Iowa? And do you feel that enough is being done to address flooding issues in Iowa? And we were, we were kind of mystified by the large percentage of what we consider to be kind of ambivalent survey takers. Um, and kind of makes me wonder if they wondered what we meant by addressing the issue. So it could have been an interpretation of that question that depends on what we were implying. Um, but again, that's just speculation on my part. The, the use and desire to learn more about best management practices was, in my opinion, as someone that has a big emphasis on education to be one of the most critical components of this survey. What do people want to learn more about? What are they using? How can we direct future educational programming in the watershed? And the three most common, commonly used BMPs right now in this watershed are crop rotation, grass waterways, and no tip. And this is about where my heart fell out. We asked folks what they wanted to learn more about and provided a list of both urban and rural BMPs, probably 20 to 25 different practices, everything from rain barrels to recycling and household paints and chemicals, you know, a variety of, of things. And no single BMP received more than 10% of an interest from the survey takers that they wanted to learn more about. And, and I think that question was pretty straightforward, so I'm not sure if it was a matter of interpretation. And maybe that they feel that they're doing enough. I don't know. So one of the final questions we asked in the survey was familiarity with Iowa's nutrient reduction strategy, which is a couple years old now. Um, pretty rural watershed. Uh, census data in our survey suggested it's, it's older, a little less technologically plugged in. Um, these are folks that are going to attend your webinars. You need to bring town hall meetings to their local community, whether they have a bar or a library or um, a legion, and, and, and bring the education to them. Um, the majority of folks in the watershed have not heard the nutrient reduction strategy. But it gets better. So we divided it up by farmers and non-farmers. <clears throat> and we were really disappointed to see that so many farmers I mean, we just asked them if they'd heard of it. Not that they could, you know, write a thesis on it. Just have you heard of it? Do you know what it is? I don't know any other phrase that it's called right now. I think nutrient reduction strategy is kind of the standard. This indicates an educational deficit. But one of the reasons why we did the survey is precisely for this reason. It shows us areas that we can target educational programming in the future, and that's why this information is so incredibly helpful. So with that, great. Right, we're going to save questions for the last uh, 15 minutes or so of the presentation. So depending on your questions, if you have any, um, we'll get those addressed. Hi, my name is uh, Jennifer Fetzel, and I'm the Environmental Services Director with East Central Iowa Council of Government. I have been working with the Indian Creek Watershed Management Authority in Lynn County for the last couple of years. I'll just give a little background on our watershed. <coughs> it is um, fairly unique in that the entire Hop 10 watershed is located in Lynn County. It is an urban rural split. It's actually a greater percentage of the land is developed. Um, about 63, 64,000 people. And we've got impaired waterways for both Dry Creek and Indian Creek. 
And we have the metro area, which includes Cedar Rapids, Marion, Hiawatha, and Robbins, all have concerns with their um, stormwater discharge permit compliance. Just to give you a little perspective, where so this is Lynn County and where our watershed lies. So for our social assessment, um, we got planning money in, well, we really got started in 2013. And uh, so we set out to do an RFP to get to hire a, some kind of research firm that would do a social assessment for us. They quickly learned that we did not have enough funding for that. So um, we applied for additional money and were awarded some additional money from the DNR in the fall of 2013. And then we hired a local firm, Burn Research Group at Cedar Rapids, and uh, they approached uh, the whole project in we felt sort of a unique way they said they're going to they have um, you know a panel that they routinely go to to do survey work and that they would be able to deliver us urban residents um, the uh, and target questions to those different audiences and uh, be able to tailor the survey to the specific audience so we thought that was um, a unique approach I'll get a little more into the audience here in a second. The other thing that we did, um, we set out to do a creek user survey. So we developed a one-page interview style uh, survey that we had AmeriCorps volunteers go out and do. Initially, we didn't get a whole lot done, and then we uh, partnered with Co College to get the rest of it completed in 2014. So the goal of the survey, again, as has been mentioned, is just to to get the awareness levels, see what kinds of um, uh, issues are perceived in the watershed, see what practices might be used or what people might want to learn more about, and then um, how people are using the creek, and what information sources they use and what they trust. So here's our target audiences. As I said, we did that um, creek user survey and um, split that up. And we were able then to get fall um, cold weather, sort of winter, but not exactly winter, and then some spring. So we were able to get some different seasons. But for our online survey, we targeted farmers and owners of farmland in the watershed. We targeted these like urban suburban homeowners and business owners. And so the reason I'm being specific about owners of property is because the only way to make an online survey work where you target and ask questions is if the respondents are associated with a particular address so that you can um, filter out those that were in the watershed or old land in the watershed and those who were outside the watershed. So that was a little uh, tricky um, and time consuming. And I just want to thank everybody who was on our technical team or board and for helping me through this process because I thought I was going to go bad at one point. Um, so, which one slide doesn't capture all the drama, but I'll try and break it down. So we, um, we worked with Vernon and then we used some uh, sample surveys from other places to get our, our uh, questions for our survey. I do have a couple of copies of the survey if you want to see it, but we had 23 versions of, of survey. And I think Vernon told us that we win the prize for most revised survey ever. Um, I'm not sure if that's good or bad. So the online survey used skip logic to, uh, again, you were asked some questions to define your eligibility, whether you were in a watershed or not, and whether you own farmland or were a homeowner, and then the questions were tailored then to you. Um, so it's a little bit difficult to pin down exactly how many questions folks answered, but this sort of outlines how, how the survey, how people would have gone through the survey. The other issue is because of you know the, the uh, additional funding that we asked for, because of the long drawn out uh, survey drafting process, we launched the survey at the absolute worst time possible, and we didn't mean to. It just happened that way. So it went live in eight, late April. Really, <laughs> we're trying to survey farmers, and we released the survey in April. Anyway, we did what we could. Um, it ended up being open until. Um, through the end of August, and uh, like I said, we did complete those user, <coughs> creek user surveys. 
throughout that time as well. <coughs> so for the initial survey that we did, it was, um, as I said, Vernon has a panel of you know, go-to people to get survey work done. We also um, emailed invitations to take the survey with the link to lots of groups, a watershed group, and asked them to pass it on, and employees of the cities that we were working with, and you know, just tried to reach as many folks as we could. We had postcards mailed, the Soil and Water Conservation District mailed uh, 550 postcards to the rural folks. And then we did press releases and we had banners on uh, websites and we tried to uh, up our uh, survey response in that way. So as I said, for a lot of reasons, we had very low turnout for the <coughs> farmer respondents. Um, at that time, we weren't really sure what the culprit was, you know, the bad timing, the, you know, what was it exactly. So we did some additional marketing work, um, really focused on trying to get those completes. And uh, the Vernon actually sent some folks to the county fair and sort of had a listening post and heard some pretty um, direct, uh, you know, we, you just going to use this against me and I don't you know, have anything to do with this and you know, who are you people and, and stuff like that. So um, what we ultimately ended up doing is to uh, work with our local farm bureau chapter and they did a really nice cover letter for us and we specifically mailed 255 farmers that the Soil Water Conservation District felt would be, you know, perhaps likely to respond. And so we were able to get our response rate at least up to um, manageable level. So the other thing that I thought was interesting is um, all told, over a thousand people attempted to take the survey. They were just, you know, most of them were filtered out because they didn't live in the watershed. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And this breaks down the responses that we got by the different kinds of audiences. Majority were residents. We did get 50 farmers ultimately to get a good completed survey. So the remaining slides that I have are from uh, the presentation that our research did. So this was their overall presentation to the group um, on their results. And this is just a very, the, the report is huge. So this is a very quick snapshot of what we found out. So in general, um, residents and farmers viewed, uh, oh, right, water quality uh, better for things that don't require coming in contact with the farm. And that was actually proven out to the creek users. You know, very few of those respondents indicated that they were uh, interested in or engaged in fishing or paddling or you know, wading or anything where they would actually come in contact with the farm. Which this slide now shows you. So pretty much out um, for a run or a jog or kids playing on the playground that was in close proximity to the creek. Those kinds of uses. So here, and somewhat differently than what um, the issues were identified in Jody's watershed, for our watershed, residents and farmers agree that it's mainly the urban area contributing to water quality problems. So we have agreement. Um, so you can kind of see what those responses were. Flooding in our watershed was rated as the uh, most significant issue by both. And um, they have suffered so a great deal of flooding. This one is uh, the residents, so they definitely uh, can see the connection that what they do has an impact. Uh, they are willing to, uh, if you know, change their practices, it would improve water quality. So, um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Now on the uh, other hand, this is the beliefs and uh, values of the farm population, and they have this really strong um, <coughs> land ethic where you know, you leave the, the land better than when I started, I'm concerned about erosion, um, I'm concerned about erosion from my neighbors feel so acknowledging some impact. 
and they believe that they can make a difference. They are willing to change, and cost is not, uh, management practices are not too costly for their operation. But there's actually another slide that will contradict that here in just a moment. They, both residents and farmers feel that it's really up to the citizens, it's up to the individual and local authorities. We, you know, it's absolutely the federal government and the state government out of it. <clears throat> so in terms of practices for residents, they, majority of them claim that they do these things. They you know, get their glass press clippings out of the ditches, they dispose of the trash properly, they apply their pesticides properly, so look good there. They are all doing it. <laughs> er, yeah, right. <laughs> and so farmers, in terms of practices, they are rotating crops, they're uh, uh, grass water base, um, they are, you know, application, they're paying attention to their application, soil tests, we're, we're, we're good on these practices, but what they're not adopting yet are some of these things that we've heard about here at the conference, the bioreactors, saturated buffer strip till. There is uh, some use of cover, cover crops, and I think that if we were to do this, repeat this again, that number would probably go up, according to the Soil and Water Conservation <coughs> So this is asking for, for barriers to um, implementing practices and uh, the out-of-pocket expenses are uh, a very significant barrier. So that, this, is our, this is our place where you know, the answers don't quite mesh. So in terms of how people prefer to receive their information, definitely email, websites, online searches. So the light, lighter blue bars are the residents, the darker blue are the farmer population. Um, and there are some obvious differences here. Direct mail is um, one of the ones that the farm population identified as uh, a more helpful uh, method of communication which we discovered when obviously the online survey didn't work as well as when we mailed a hard copy to them and they were able to return. And I should say that I don't bring up anything here about um, incentives. The initial survey had uh, an enter to win, you know, give us your responses and you'll be entered to win a drawing and we have these fabulous prizes. And then that was the first go. And then there was red box rentals, you know, uh, specific to farm populations and trying to get that out. <clears throat> and then the, um, the direct mail survey actually had, you know, give us your completed survey and we'll donate $20 to your local uh, 4-H or your local FFA chapter. And that was something that was, was indeed motivating for that population. So the, just in our own internal trying to get completes, we sort of helped answer some of these questions and how to reach people and, and what they um, feel is significant, what they care about. And then in terms of what organizations that, or what kinds of uh, information people trust, the residents were a little more trusting um, just overall, but the uh, sources were the same, were the highest for these. So local soil and water conservation, the ISU extension service, um, NRCS, which it's interesting to me that, you know, ra random urban residents even know what pine doubles is. I mean, we did spell it out in the survey, but um, I just thought that was, I can see extension service and soil and water, but I don't know. So they rate those a little even higher than the farmers did just in general. And so we have, as I said, I have a couple of printed uh, copies of the survey, which is long, but uh, also on our website here, our Indian Creek Watershed website, we have the full report of all of the slides and all of the results. So thank you very much.
repeat everything uh, that both sides are talking really about the same things. Uh, Member on the left side here with Northeast Iowa RCD Watershed Plan there. And uh, we've been working with the Turkey River Watershed Management Authority for more than 2012. Uh, just a little bit quickly about the turkey. We're nestled up there in Northeast Iowa. Uh, and then, you know, the unique setting of the Driftless area, about half the watershed falls on the Pilates of the and then half that falls on the Iowa surface. So we have that uh, as, a, as a unique characteristic of the watershed. Um, give you a little zoomed in view here. It's a little over a million acre Huff Deep watershed. Um, it's a very large area for us to work in. Uh, not typically what you see with watershed projects in Iowa. A lot of the work that uh, watershed projects in Iowa focus on are the falls, uh, not the fields. Um, you can see we have quite a few communities, uh, but we don't have a lot of people. The largest community is situated right about the center of the watershed of West Virginia, about 2,500 people. So that's our largest uh, community population-wise. Uh, total population is over 32,000 people. Um, so a very rural, very egg. Uh, watershed, which isn't unusual for Iowa. So if you've ever driven a car or walked into an airport, then you know that you know, this is kind of where society is these days. It's very easy to fall into this um, blinders on, sort of nobody paying attention to what's going on around them. And I think when we started this project, we wanted to make sure that we didn't fall into this exact same category and just say, well, we can come up with this awesome plan and and we'll have the solution and we'll hand it to the authority and they can take it from there. We wanted to know what those 32,000 people were thinking, what they thought about flooding, what they thought about water quality, and what they would actually do to, to, to fix it. So this was actually written on a survey, and I think it, you know, as you can see, it was written on a blank survey. They didn't fill it out. So they weren't counted in the results. However, maybe this is more valuable than any statistics that I'm about to show you because this shows, you know, where we're at. Right? So one of the purposes that we have is we want to know what people think of the major issues. And, and the Watershed Management Authority was formed really for the, the two major issues that we've talked about a lot, and that's flooding and water quality. And specifically, flooding has been a huge problem in the Turkey River watershed. Our watershed management chair likes to say that everything that goes to that we've been flooding in the Turkey River before people knew what flooding was. So I don't know why that's true, but you know, we want to know how people have been impacted in flooding. How you know what population within this watershed is this really affecting? Wanted to know what people are already doing, what they would do, and how we can connect with those people so that we can get somebody out there or educate them and, and bring everybody sort of to the same level of discussing these problems. And then we wanted to know who would participate. What we did, we um, a, a little bit different method. Um, we focused on flooding with our survey because that was such a prime issue at the time. Um, we mailed the survey. Uh, it was randomly selected from parcel data. Uh, we, we separated it into rural and urban residents. The way we did that is we mailed to a thousand rural residents, uh, primarily landowners, um, and 500 urban residents. And you know, they use the term urban loosely, considering that a lot of these communities are less than a thousand people. Um, and it was a very short survey. Uh, we built the survey off of um, examples that we get, we garnered from uh, soil and water conservation districts and NRCS offices that had put out surveys, similar type of surveys in the past. So we sort of built on that simple 13 question survey one page front and back that we mailed out and uh and we mailed it in september 2013 we asked for it back um you know, by the end of the month this is another you know common i have a few of these mixed in and like i said these are almost um, more valuable and then it kind of shows where folks in the watershed are as far as education level um so of a thousand rural residents we actually got a uh, very good response rate. Um, we had 325 completed in return, which gave us a 35% response rate, and that was with just sending it out blindly, no um, no letter to warn them that there was a survey coming. Uh, there was just a simple cover letter explaining what the survey was and its purpose, and then asking for them to return. Uh, so that's very pretty good response rate. We did have 91 that were undeliverable based on because of the parcel data that we were using. 
not quite as good a response rate for the urban residents, um, whether that be because they weren't directly affected and it felt um, we had a lot more of the comments this doesn't apply to me, uh, from those uh, particular people. We did mark the surveys that we know, um, whether they came from a rural or uh, urban landowner. So a combined 30% response rate, so we felt pretty good about that. Um, that was giving us a nice uh, representation of the population. So of the total um, response rate, they gave us a total of 416 respondents and uh, a 4.8 confidence interval at 95% confidence level, which basically means that if we have surveyed all 32,000 plus people, we can be 95% sure that we would have been plus or minus 4.8% of our responses. So, we felt that, it, like I said, that that's a very good representation of, of what most people are, are, are finding. So some of our findings, nearly a third of the residents that responded have been directly impacted by flooding. And we asked them to rate that um, by, by level of damage, whether it be no damage, slight damage, moderate, or heavy. And uh, most of them have been impacted more than once, and a lot of them had some level of damage, whether that be and how they rate damages is obviously there. Um, three, four, three out of four people in the, in the watershed knew somebody that had been impacted. So if they weren't directly impacted themselves, they knew somebody that was. And the majority of people in the watershed felt that not enough was being done to address flooding. We also asked a number of different, and I didn't, I didn't put it up here as so far as what we asked uh, people that causes flooding, but some examples would be climate change or tiling or ag practices. Um, and we asked them what, what those would, would be. And, and as you can expect, we got a variety of answers. There really was no one thing that jumped out that people said, well, this is the problem. Most people said it was more than one thing. And, and that, that kind of goes to show, I guess, you know, not everybody agrees with what the problem is, but everybody agrees with the problem. Um, we also asked people whether flooding or water quality is a bigger issue. And although flooding did stand out as what people felt was a bigger issue, a number of people uh, did say it was very close, actually. And between the two, and a lot of people said both. Well, they were equally important. Um, and then we asked people what, what's the best way to get in touch with them. And as you can imagine, since we have a very rural watershed and very small communities, Twitter was not the number one response. <laughs> Um, but traditional methods, mail, uh, mail and face to face, and there are a number of people that uh, said they were using internet and, and email. Um, however, since those methods of communication are so private, um, particularly <coughs> email, um, it's not necessarily a great way for us to contact landowners unless we have some sort of sign up. And, and we do on our website, but um, it's probably a pretty small number of people that are actually signing up for those things. So. We feel that mail and face-to-face -face contact is still the best way to interact with the owners. So we asked people, you know, what are they doing on their land? Um, a lot of, of responses. Uh, certainly, there's a concern that there's a number of people doing nothing, and but a lot of people are doing something. Um, now, what percentage of their farm is in a grass waterway, or? How effective those waterways are is, is obviously uh, left unknown, but um, there are a number of people doing something. And I think the number one question that we had uh, that we've used, you know, to better tell them for our results is that almost two thirds of the people at the, the final question was, would you be willing on your property to do something about flooding or water quality and or water quality? And two thirds of people said yes. So 32,000 people, that means we have 100,000 people that are willing to do it, or take the, the, the number of acres and say two thirds of the watershed would do it. That's a pretty impressive number. So we feel like if we can get out to those people and, and talk to them, and, you know, not just us, but, but the Southern Water District Center or whoever it is, um, then we can actually make a difference and, and do it. So this was, um, if you want to find out the, the full results, the full report is down on the Florida Water website. Um, and um, I think this is my favorite quote you know, for the, the, the watershed. I made us feel pretty good. That was certainly 
Um, we had a number of positive responses. I was pleasantly surprised by the, by the positive responses that we got from people in the watershed. Um, and we weren't being run out of town. I think that if this was strictly a water quality survey, we would have had a different viewpoint. A lot of people are tired of hearing that. Uh, if you go to um, a landowner and say, would you do something to help your neighbor uh, prevent flooding on this land, you would probably jump all over it. Even if they're putting in the same practice that they've been asked the week before to do something to improve water quality. Uh, that's just something that we've seen, not necessarily from the survey, but just interacting with people. It's, it, it may be working to the same end, uh, but through a different means. So um, I think that the survey is really valuable, but uh, there's certainly a lot that uh, we, we learned from it. And uh, this is just one small piece, I think, for all of us. Um, if I can speak for all of us in that, uh, it's a very small piece of our planning process. Um, it's just one way to kind of get input from the, the, the locals and find out what they would actually do. So when, when we do complete our, our watershed plans, that they will be successful and they will um, be implemented uh, going forward. Great. So we have um, quite a bit of time left, actually, for questions. So one Research um, 
you know, this is what they do. So they had lots of demographic questions, both to determine you know, whether they were in the watershed or not, but then at the end of the survey, there was the age and the income, the education level, and gender, and all those things. I didn't show those results, but in general, our, our survey ended up with a really good mix of um, ages and gender, and it was pretty balanced, at least from their perspective. So I'm taking them at their you know, professional opinion that, that it's uh, a good representation. Yeah, uh, <coughs> this is a uh, how valuable, I mean, doing the social <coughs> assessment up front. You know, if you can speak to how that has changed, perhaps, thinking about how you're going to do I would say profoundly. I, I, I think that it is. You know, we have census data, we, you know, to, to get some basic demographic data, but there's, if, when it comes to attitudes and perceptions, all that I knew before we did the survey of attitudes and perceptions were those of people who bothered to show up to any of our events and express those attitudes or opinions. And so, to me, I think this allowed me, we, we dealt with a fair amount of suspicion. We got a lot of comments, you know, who are you people and who's paying for this? And, you know, what's this information gonna be used for? But overwhelmingly so, the majority of people took our survey answered nearly every question on the survey. And we jumped around in our office and people were like sprawling extraneous information in the margins that we didn't even ask for. It's like, you get them talking about their land. It's like people love to talk about their land. So for the most part, I feel like they gave us a lot. And I'm really grateful for it. I really do think it, it will shape the direction of our land in ways that no other data out there could. I agree. We ended up um, a little bit sort of uh, modifying a bit of the planning process on the fly, it just both in terms of how the responses were coming in and, you know, um, how difficult it was to get responses from a particular you know, audience in our watershed. Just, that just led us to try and think differently about how we were going about the planning process. I think at the point at which we get our um, implementation section done and our actions that the watershed plan identifies, I think the social, this kind of information, as Jody said, is just like invaluable. I mean, this tells us then what people are interested in. We know that we need to focus on um, more information about rain barrels and rain gardens. Very few people indicated they had ever heard of it. So that's the whole. Um, just being able to sort of uh, tailor the outreach and the ed education, I think, is really going to be helpful. Yeah, I just said that. I mean, it really, really helps you realize what the le level of knowledge is, I guess, with the population that you're working with. Um, you have a number of people that write, I mean, put one quote in about saying that this doesn't to me, but that was not the only one. And to, to, have, to have that thought that people still think that they don't live in a watershed, it's a little bit disturbing. Um, <laughs> and, 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 I mean, if you pay taxes, if you do anything, you're paying for flooding and water quality problems. Um, so the thing that people don't think that applies to them, that was a big deal. Um, the other thing I would add to that is just our final question, knowing that two thirds of people would do something. It prompted. Um, now, we don't have 20,000 people coming to our meetings. So that means we need to get out somebody you know, <coughs> to get anything implemented. We need boots on the ground, we need people out there talking, interacting with people to get things done. So I think that's, that was one of the most valuable things. If I could only do one question, that would be it for the whole survey. I have a question more so for. Uh, Jennifer, if you had to do a lot of work to get more farmer responses in your watershed than the other two watersheds did, and do you have a list of reasons why? Was it because your WMA was considered a, a city WMA, but um, the other two were not? I'm not saying the other two have I two score. It is, it is interesting that um, our responses were basically flipped, you know, in terms of numbers. You had far more um, 
rural or farm farmer responses. I don't know. I think it's a combination of things. I think it was initially the timing was terrible. The uh, method, I don't think, <coughs> in the end was the initial method wasn't workable. Uh, we had. I wish if we had to do it over again, I would change the timing. I would do the uh, mail, the hard copy of the survey under a cover from a local group like the Farm Bureau, and um, and I think you're probably right in that. Uh, there is a bit, as flooding is a major concern in our watershed, and as you can see what both uh, target audiences defined as the issues, they're urban. Whether that's true or not, that is the perception. So, um, yeah, I think that probably, and, and we did not focus our questions just to flooding. We had both water quality and flooding. Um, questions and like Ross said it could be a little bit of the tiresomeness of water quality talk you know uh, that they just didn't want to respond ours was I mean identified as completely random or completely anonymous excuse me uh, so we did have that but um, yeah I, I couldn't say exactly but I think it's all of those things probably yeah, I want to say back to that. We, we provided an option to take the survey online. We invited folks to take it through the postcard. And we, we had a feeling it wasn't going to be OK. And it wasn't. We had 28 online surveys out of 165. And, and it's a great expense to, to basically uh, send surveys out to 800, 688 landowners in a paper format with postage paid return mail, knowing that <laughs> not going to get probably 75% of it back, right? Um, but we knew in our watershed that that's how we had to do it. And I think that that's why our distribution between farmers and non-farmers, for example, will probably a little more level in that we just we just sent paper copies to people's homes and, and said, please take this. This is who we are. This is why we're doing this. Um, we know that you own land here. We really appreciate so I think methodology is a great part of it. There was a question about the specific question. Did you have any feedback on the aesthetics of some of these practices as you look into the, the beautiful or, you know, it didn't look like that in the questions about that. We, we did not have any questions about that, and I'm not, you know, I'm, I didn't wade through all the comments if there were. There were very few open-ended. Uh, boxes on our survey in particular like these guys have some really nice like personal quotes if you will we we didn't really end up with that in our version so. prairies uh, native plantings things like that were options they weren't very popular you know ours is a very ag intensive watershed it's mostly row crops those things are could probably considered a little on the fluffy side um, in all practicality for, for our demographic. So, and, and, and this survey was intended to just kind of scratch the surface on a wide variety of topics versus getting too in-depth in any one topic, but that's, that's a good consideration for maybe a future survey. Uh, I know Ms. Ross had a fairly short responses about native plantings. Uh, did you guys have any other people on that? We didn't, so it was left up to their interpretation as to what a native planting was. Um, <laughs> so Perfect. Perfect. I mean, it could be, yeah. You know, in hindsight, it, you have to kind of walk that fine line of being very wordy and yeah. detailed response, and then people just blazing over and not wanting to read it. So right. Um, but in this case, we had very simple answers, and it's open to interpretation. Um, I would I would venture to guess that the number of people that were doing all these things were you know, it's very limited, and whether or not they're actually being effective is I don't know. Like crop rotation is a perfect example. We had a large number of those in our watershed say they use crop rotation for what they think might be a conservation-oriented crop rotation might be very different from what your local district conservationist would have to say. How many rotations, you know, how many crops are in your rotation? 
So yeah, there's there's some questions that again you can battle that you want to be crisp and clear, um, but you don't want to abhor them when too too much technical or academic language. You want to be answering the question, so it's it's a it's a juggling act. Right. I came in late, so I apologize. But <clears throat> to that water quality kind of overload question. Did you all break it down in terms of things that they maybe are thinking about in terms of water quality for drinking, um, recreation, uh, fish, you know, things that people, I think sometimes resonate with them better about, they're concerned about drinking water, they're concerned about you know, eating the fish or being able to fish or even wildlife. Did you did you get into that very much with your surveys? And, and we, what's we, the did a, we did a little bit. We asked them, for example, a question about what they use. <coughs> The, the English River, the four rivers that are part of the valley. You know, what 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 are their uses? And you know, are, do they fish? Do they swim? Do they kayak? Um, are they there? You know, do they use them for aesthetic beauty? And we also ask some questions about the quality of the surface waters and the quality of drinking water sources. Um, so we got into that a little bit. Um, you know, we asked folks if they use the water for things like crop irrigation or livestock uh, watering. So somewhat, but but not intensively. So sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize what I was drinking. Sorry. <laughs> so we did do a little bit of that. Um, <clears throat> so we asked about you know uses and uh, concern about uh, water quality. For the most part, um, surface water it, it, uh, was rated better for things that they didn't have to touch the water for, pretty much. And there, there was great concern about drinking water, um, but we didn't really get in any more detail to that. We really didn't touch on it. Um, this is simply since we were focused more on flooding. Uh, we did have a couple questions that address water quality, but um, we didn't touch on it because it, we just didn't go down that road with this particular survey. I think for you, I mean, the, the turkey for recreation is, is a huge aspect. It's an economic driver, and so you know, I would think that people see that. But then there's also the concern about too many aircraft people being in the water. So I don't know. But it seems like it would be an issue for you to, to highlight more quality in terms of economic terms for recreation. Well, we are just about out of time. I do want to just have each of you guys mention when you expect to complete your plans. Um, just so folks have a sense of that. And then I think we'll wrap it up from there. So thank you all very much. Yeah. So our plan will be wrapped up in June of this year. Um, and we will, as we move forward, keep putting pieces of it on our website uh, as we go. Uh, right now we're looking at July, which is a few months out from our original hoped for um, finish date. Uh, we do have a data section on our website as well, and as new data from the hydrologic assessment, water quality snapshots, which are all done now, those things are being added to the website just for full disclosure and to share information. Um, they're all going to feed into the plan, but uh, they're on the website. And uh, we actually have two comprehensive plans that we're working on, one for flooding and one for water quality. Um, and our flood plan is going to be finished up this spring in May. It will be available and um, our water quality plan will actually be finished at the end of the year, December. So uh, both plans will be completed this year. And I'm very excited for that. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you guys very much.